Henry Ford once said, coming together is the beginning, staying together is progress, and working together is success. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to episode number 528 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry, brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by yours truly, Amelia Dalton. Happy Friday, everyone. I am happy to announce that Risk 5 CTO Mark Himmelstein is joining me this week. Mark and I are chatting all about the history of Risk 5, why Risk 5 is more popular than ever before, the benefits that Risk 5 can bring to high performance computing, and how you can take advantage of the Risk 5 exchange. And also this week, I investigate the incredible edible battery. So first up, please welcome Mark to Fish Fry. Hi, Mark. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Good to meet you. So Mark, Risk Five just celebrated your 10th anniversary. So tell me a little bit about the history of Risk Five and what your organization looks like today. Absolutely. So Risk Five started in Berkeley. Berkeley had a long tradition of developing architectures back to risk one in the 80s, very clearly led by David Patterson, one of his students, Krista Sanovich, who is our chairman of the board and the creator of risk five. Over time, it became clear that there was a hunger for an open standard ISA around 2015, 2016. They started moving it into project under Linux Foundation. And when they started, it was just something kind of small and simple. I joined in June of 2020. There were 15 technical groups and there are now about 70. It's become a very big thing. I think the major reason why people end up using RISC V is around flexibility. They can do with it what they like. We're a community because we get to share the work of developing the instruction set architecture and all the software ecosystem around it. People don't have to go ahead and do that themselves. In today's day and age, even large companies can't support the creation of an ISO all by themselves. And so uh, we work together to do that. Fantastic. All right. So, Mark, you gave a talk at DVCon this year called Risk Five Everywhere. Now, I am certainly seeing Risk Five everywhere these days. What industry trends or design challenges do you see motivating the adoption of Risk Five? Risk five provides an amount of flexibility that other architectures don't. They either restrict any kind of customization or customized implementations, or they have a structure that makes it very difficult uh, from a financial or innovation perspective. And so Risk five, we encourage innovation. We have custom extensions built in that vendors can go ahead and implement their own thing. It's really very hard to go ahead and support compilers and operating systems and all those pieces yourself. And so people really want to work together. But if they have something that's going to either differentiate for them or they have time to market, they're going to go ahead and do that. We've seen an incredible uptake in risk five cores out there for profit. So probably in 2021, there are in excess of 10 billion cores sold for profit. The runway for things that are embedded, IoT, industrial controllers, controllers that go into computers like video controllers, the runway for those things are a lot shorter than things like servers and automobiles and things like that. Disk drives are a year and a half, probably servers are more three to five years. So a lot of what you're seeing are in wearables, IoT devices, NVIDIA's video controllers. So there's just a ton of RISC-V cores out there. And as you see people adopting it, it gets easier for other people to adopt it. Also, the other thing that happens is in a more of an IoT embedded kind of world, every time you do a new generation of your product, you look to see what's out there. So it's like a whole new greenfield opportunity. People aren't doing you know, forklifts of their architectures in order to go to RISC-V. It's more of uh, new opportunities. Uh, we have a soldering iron done by Pine64 for RISC-V all the way up to uh, supercomputers and everything in between inference engines that have a thousand cores on a die. So it's showing up everywhere. The gentleman who runs uh, Ventana at the last summit in one of our talks, 
And he said, this year you're going to start seeing various servers come out in initial quantities on RISC V cores. So we're all very excited about this. Excellent. Well, Mark, I was really interested in the RISC V exchange. Can you tell my audience more about that? Yeah, absolutely. So it doesn't matter if you're a member of RISC V or not. If you're putting out a product with RISC V, services, software, IP, chips, systems, etc., you can advertise on risk5.org, our main, you know, our website for free. And we have a large and growing catalog of folks who have advertised all the things that I've talked about. And people ask me, hey, where do I find this? And the first thing I tell them is go to Risk 5 Exchange because that's where people go ahead and advertise these things. And whatever it is, uh, we have vendors out there who are advertising their products. Fantastic. Now, Mark, you also recently announced the first international workshop, HPC-based RISC-V. So tell me specifically about the benefits that RISC-V can bring to the high-performance computing space. Yeah, and I'm glad that you noticed the HPC stuff. And we had a lot of people at, uh, I don't know how you pronounce it, High Peak or whatever it is in France that happened in January. Uh, we've been involved with HPC for a very long time. Uh, The the gentleman who runs our special interest group on HPC is from Barcelona Supercomputer Center, but there's a lot of interest. And again, I think it has to do with flexibility because when you're doing HPC, you're headed towards a specific solution to solve things like gas exploration or defense things or large AI ML projects, things like that. And the ability to put together a bunch of cores and processors based on an open standard that you can go ahead again and implement the way that is conducive to success in your solution is just very attractive to everybody. Absolutely. All right, Mark, it's time for your off-the-cuff question. Now, since you haven't been on my show before, you get my standard off-the-cuff. So here we go. Mark, if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, you need a passport to get there, or the restaurant is closed, or you make it yourself, what would you have? Well, I, I will tell you, I, I like letting ingredients speak for themselves. I'm 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 a cook, and and cook a lot. I, I smoke a lot of things. I pickle things. I you know, cook soups, etc. cetera. Um, but my two favorite things, you know, I haven't changed for a long time. And I think they would make a great meal together. And that's uh, live Maine lobster and, and watermelon. So uh, that those are my favorites. I love it. And you know, Mark, we've had both of those answers separately, but never together. I love it. (laughs) Well, Mark, I think that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure. Good to meet you. Edible batteries? Why, yes. So get this. A team of researchers at IIT, or the Italian Institute of Technology, led by senior researcher Mario Caroni, have developed an experimental edible battery that was inspired by biochemical redox reactions, which produce energy in the cells of humans and other animals. All right, let's get into the details. So first, the anode. The anode for this battery is made of riboflavin. Yes, vitamin B2. And its cathode is composed of quercetin, which is a plant pigment, and a versatile antioxidant that is mostly found in grapes, onions, cherries, broccoli, berries, and citrus fruits. The edible goodness does not stop there. Oh no. The permeable membrane that goes between the anode and the cathode that prevents short circuits is made of nori seaweed. There is also two food-grade gold foil contacts that protrude from a beeswax coating on the anode and cathode as well. While not very tasty, activated charcoal is also used to increase conductivity in this new battery as well. So I hear you. Loud and clear, my loyal fish frying audience. Yes, that sounds good enough to eat, but what kind of power are we talking about here? So, once this battery is at its full charge, this 0.65 volt battery 
can provide 48 microampere current for 12 minutes or just a few microamps for over an hour. Yes, that does not sound like very much, but it is enough to power small electronic devices like low power LEDs. Head researcher Caroni says this about the future of this technology. He says, future potential uses range from edible circuits and sensors that can monitor health conditions to powering of sensors for monitoring food storage conditions. Moreover, given the level of safety of these batteries, they could be used in children's toys where there is a high risk of ingestion. Actually, we're already developing devices with greater capacity and reducing the overall size. Okay, so it's important to point out that this is not the first edible battery to find its way out of a research facility. Way back in 2016, researchers at Carnegie Mellon University developed an edible battery that utilizes melanin for either the anode or the cathode, along with a second substance like manganese oxide or benign metal magnesium to form the second terminal. In terms of performance, that battery with 600 milligrams of melanin as the cathode can power a 5 milliwatt device for 18 hours and was definitely targeted toward timed drug delivery. So, will we be seeing more edible battery technology on the horizon? I certainly hope so. If you want even more information about this incredible edible battery developed by the Italian Institute of Technology, I've included a couple links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's episode on YouTube, including a link to the associated research paper called An Edible Rechargeable Battery. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into Twitter, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal Twitter account, check out Amelia D 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, sure, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me. And you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, by clicking the links below the player on this week's Fish Frying page, you can subscribe to this here podcast through Spotify, Podbean, or Apple Podcasts. And remember, if you'd like to further support this podcast, please leave me a review on that podcasting platform of your choice. It really does help. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of April 21st, 2023, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.